Okay, hi, good afternoon, everyone. We are going to talk this week on speckle tracking echocardiography, which is not, I guess, a subject that's going to feature majorly in the exams. It's, of course, something you probably have heard a little bit about. I'm going to take you through the basic principles. A few, uh, I might show you how to do it on a on a case that I've got behind. Um, just so you can see what it is, because most people will see the curves and not really know what they mean, so I'll try and explain it by actually showing you as well. And just try and sort of demystify it a little bit. They've, uh, you know, I don't think this will be the lion's share of the exam. I think it's good to know some of these advanced techniques, in particular speckle tracking in 3D, I guess are the two things I'll ask about. So we'll just go through some of those and, uh, again, just try and explain, explain exactly what those parts are. Obviously, given a talk or two on this, so I might just switch and see if I can share with you my screen. Okay, let me start with this bit. So. I guess the thing to, to know about speckle tracking is that it can elucidate cardiac dysfunction that we might miss with other standard imaging modalities and things like ejection fraction. And some of the theory behind that has got to do with the way of the myocardial architecture of the heart. So if we're just looking at the left ventricle here in these beautiful pictures, which I think is uh, from MRI, um, tagged MRI images. The, the left ventricle has a bunch of fibers that are wrapped around each other. So the predominant muscle fiber direction is sort of 45 degrees to each other with some longitudinal ones, particularly in the middle. So sort of the longitudinal ones are more in the middle and then the curved ones are along the outside. And that gives the, the heart a twisting function as it contracts. Um, and I think that's, if you're looking at the apex, the apex goes, uh, uh, counterclockwise, the uh, base goes clockwise and they kind of wrap towards each other. Okay, so it's like the, uh, the acronym is if you were going to grab a wet towel and ask you to get the water out of it, you don't squash it like that, you twist it and the heart follows that same principle. And I guess the way that talks to me in my head is that if I gave you that wet towel and asked you just to squish it down, which I guess would be the equivalent of, say, an ejection fraction, just going from that volume to that volume, you wouldn't get as much water out as if you twisted it at the same time. And so there is this idea with twist and torsion in there that there's some arguments that we could miss up to as much as 30 to 50% of cardiac function because things like ejection fraction don't analyze true systolic function. Um, and so speckle tracking can pick up things like that. So as well as trying to pick up subtle dysfunction that ejection fraction might miss, um, it can also pick up other movements such as twist and torsion and other forms of sort of strain analysis, which we'll go through, okay? So it, it, it's got this incredible potential and really exciting, uh, Excite, exciting things that it can elucidate. Okay, um, the way it works is it's called speckle tracking echocardiography. So it does what it says on the tin. You've got the myocardium uh, on an echo image is made up of little speckles, and those speckles uh, we call kernels. And those kernels are sort of we, oh, so we've highlighted one up here. These kernels are like a fingerprint on the myocardium because they're they're actually relatively stable. Well, they are stable. Uh, echo images that are made because the myocardial fibers are tiny, tiny little reflectors. And if you can remember back to your physics days, if you've got a tiny little reflector and as that sound wave comes through, if that tiny little reflector is much smaller than the sound wave, it just scatters the reflected image. And if you imagine doing that on multiple different areas of the myocardial fibers, you get lots of echo waves scattered in lots of different directions. And that means that you can get both constructive and destructive inference of those waves. As in, if you have two waves that are sort of going the same wave, if they join together, they make a really big wave, and that would look like a really bright structure in there, such as that little bright dot there. But on another side, if they, you have two waves that are sort of out of sync, and they join together, they make no sound wave, and that's what would be black. So that's why you get these kind of 
areas of the my you know, areas of the this kernel, these fingerprints that are relatively stable, and that's what the software, when you paint the myocardium, uh, it kind of locks hold of these fingerprints and it tracks them over a cardiac cycle. And the idea being that if they are a certain length apart at the beginning during diastole, and then they come to systole at the end, and they are much smaller, the difference between the two of them is strain. Okay, so speckle tracking echocardiography is just the software that tracks the kernels. And then the value, or the main value that we get, there are lots of values available. The main value we get is called strain. Okay, and that's just a measure of deformation. So it's the same thing as you take a piston, you squash it through, it goes under a certain amount of strain. And so it's all about myocardial shortening. Okay, so it's the length that you start at minus the length that you end up at divided by the length that you end up at. Um, is the is the, the uh, is the strain okay? So if you start off with something 100% long or 10 centimeters long, and it comes down to being 75% long, that is minus 25%. And so strain is always a negative value uh, for things like longitudinal strain, as that uh, heart contracts, as those muscles contract. Uh, you have gone down from being a certain length to a different length, so it's a negative value. And so you get curves that look like this down at the bottom, where this is over one cardiac cycle. You've got, often we separate it into six segments uh, when you're looking at either the apical four, the apical two, or the apical three. And you track these kernels as they come together. So they start off at zero, and as they come together, you get down to the peak longitudinal strain at the bottom, which is uh, the time when the muscle fibers are at the closest together, and then they go back out and they should finish where they started. Okay. We can measure in three different directions because of the three planes that are working in the heart. You've got longitudinal deformation, so that's what we call longitudinal strain, and if you add in your four, three, and two chamber analysis, you get global longitudinal strain. And that's just the average of all of those segments. We can also measure it in a radial deformation. So that's as that heart contracts and sort of twists down on itself, you can imagine that the myocardium thickens. Okay, so as the myocardium thickens, you're actually going to get these speckles that are going away from each other. And that's why you get a positive strain value there. Okay? So longitudinal, those muscle fibers coming together. So therefore, you're going from being, say, 10 centimeters to 7.5. So that's a deformation of minus 25%. In the radial direction, you'd be going from that far to that far. Those muscles are still contracting, but the speckles are separating out. And so if it's going from an originating length of 10 up to a, you know, 15, uh, then that would be a value of plus 50 in the, in the strain. Circumferential, we're measuring at that, how that heart contracts down as it twists, okay? And that means that if you imagine those kernels, if they're in one plane, they would actually get closer together as that heart twists and comes together. And that's circumferential deformation, circumferential strain, those kernels are coming together, so the strain value is negative. Classic values we talk about for these things, which are normal, are uh, in longitudinal strain, we talk about about minus 17, it sort of depends on the vendor, but about minus 17 to minus 20% is normal. For the circumferential strain, it's about minus 20, minus 25% as those things come together. And the radial strain is, uh, as it thickens, is around about the plus 45 to 50% mark. And what you'll notice if you kind of sort of average a lot of those things out is that they kind of come to the same number. And that's because it's about this theory of incompressibility. So this is from a guy called Stoylen, who is um, the guy who kind of thought up this technology. He's based out of uh, Belgium and is a little town called Leuven. And Leuven is the center of the world for strain. That's amazing. They have a conference there every year and all they talk about is speckle tracking and strain. 
I've never been and I really want to go because it sounds it's so exciting. I might not take my wife, but it sounds really exciting. A whole bunch of echo, massive echo geeks sitting there talking about strain analysis. And it's this guy, Stoyland, who sort of thought it up. And it, it, it sounds really amazing, some of the things that they've come up with. Um, if it's in uh, April, I'm there. Yeah, fantastic. It's, I think it is. It's, I think it might be May, actually. It's, uh, I want to go. The, so the theory of incompressibility means that if you take a, like a block of rubber and you squish it in one plane, it's got to expand in another. And it kind of makes sense with the heart muscle, right? Because you can't, you're not taking away any piece of muscle as you contract. So that's where the theory comes in that if whatever you're changing in the Y and the Z plane will get longer in the X plane. Um, okay, so this is what. So first of all, any any questions about that? Is that sort of clear as mud? Uh, so just one question in regards to the theory behind it with the kernels. If they if they change in terms of time and space with contraction relaxation, how is it that their acoustic properties remain the same? Because they should, if you're in one single plane, they should be the, the theory is that they stay relatively stable. And that's how the, the software can grab a hold of them and follow them through the cardiac cycle. So it brings on to a really nice point that obviously a lot of this stuff is image dependent. And that's going to become a bit extreme relevant when we start talking about in the critically ill. Um, so yeah. if as long as you're in the same plane, so you're doing it from an apical view. So particularly, I guess, for this is the, the most standard image that we kind of analysis get, getting global longitudinal strain so yep. that's where you look at your apical four chamber your apical two chamber and apical three chamber you paint the myocardium and then you follow it over that cardiac cycle and in theory those kernels should stay the same so the software can just grab a hold of it and track it through the cardiac cycle and what yep. i'm going to show you is that sometimes you, you know you've got to be careful with this and the paper i'm going to show you in a moment that that I wrote, I had the title for, you know, speckle, speckle tracking echo in the critically ill, uh, you know, the answer to non-invasive research or complete nonsense or something like that. Because it, you can imagine if you don't have decent tracking, you're not going to get decent strain results. And the thing that worries me most about speckle tracking, particularly in the critically ill, is that if you don't know what you're doing or you're a little dubious about how you do it, you can get massively weird results. And particularly with the research side of things, I sometimes worry if there's not blinded assessment that you can kind of make these numbers whatever the hell you want to do. It's a bit like ejection fraction, but worse. You know, I think when you're doing ejection fraction, the way I always say is you've got to have an idea in your head when you're looking at it first of all, and then do the ejection fraction. If you're a little bit out, then maybe the ejection fraction's okay and your eye was a little bit out too. But, you know, we're sort of using the plus or minus 10% maybe. And maybe yeah. I'll buy, you know, if I think the ejection fraction was 50% and it's more like 55 and I've got a decent endocardial border and I think I've done it okay and the long axis is the same in the four chamber and the two chamber, you know, if I followed a very standard protocol for doing it, then I might go, okay, well, that ejection fraction, my eye size may be a little bit out. We'll say 50 to 55. And it's a little bit like that with strain. You've got to use your eyeball and you've got to have an idea of what you're after. And maybe it can pick up if you think it's normal, you might pick up mild abnormalities, but you ain't going to pick up severe. You know, if you're getting severe abnormalities when you thought it was normal, there's probably something wrong with your speckle tracking. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think that's why it's really important to know about it and know some of the limitations, which of course we'll get onto. Um, so what I want to show you in this one was... Um, so yeah, we do our apical four chamber view, we do our apical two chamber view, and do our apical three chamber view. And with the GE software, you can get some of these things that are called the bullseye plot. And they're quite a nice uh, diagram for a way of visually assessing strain straight up. So what we can see here is this is a normal strain curve. So you see they're all together, clumped together quite nicely. They all come to a peak together quite nicely. So we've got synchrony. And then they all separate quite nicely and come back to the same point. And we see the apical four, the apical uh, two, and the apical three. And what they'll do on this one is that they'll, here you've got the inferior and anterior section, and they'll take these lines on the apical two chamber, uh, like that red, that red line there. Can you see my cursor? Is that okay? Um, see my cursor on the screen? Uh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So if you take that red yeah. line there, that corresponds to that 
uh, basal anterior section. So that red line there corresponds yeah. to those red lines there, which correspond to that anterior basal segment there. The next one is the yeah, blue okay. one, yeah. and then there's a blue curve, and that peak strain down there is seven, minus 17, and that corresponds to that one. If you get normal strain, which is greater than, say, minus 17, it puts it on, the, uh, on this diagram as being red. If it's uh, in the sort of moderate to severe category, they'll put it in, or so if they're in the mild category, it'll be a lighter red. If they put it in the moderate category, it goes kind of whitish, and when it starts to become desynchronous, it goes blue. So you can have this kind of color visual representation of a bullseye plot. So if it all looks red, that basically means it's normal. Okay? Yeah. And a global longitudinal strain, as we call it, is simply an average of all of those numbers. So all of those curves there in a 17 cardiac segment model get averaged together and you get your global longitudinal strain. And what that has been shown, oh, sorry, Gary. No, I was gonna say, so if you have regional wall motion abnormalities, you don't talk about global longitudinal strain? No, absolutely you can. So global longitudinal strain is just an average of all of it. So if you get regional wall, it gets included into there. And that's where it can be maybe a, a nice way of saying that there's subtle dysfunction, that, for example, uh, you know, an ejection fraction, you can have regional wall and it can still be normal. I think with a lot of strain yeah. values, if you've got regional wall motion abnormalities, you, you can get an abnormal global longitudinal strain. So just another... Sort of objective measure of showing you that there may be some abnormality there in systolic function. Yeah. But I guess with the regional wall, you can also, and I'll show you some examples in a sec, where you can have sections that are abnormal, and then from a, you know, just by eyeballing the picture, you can get an idea that there are regional wall motion abnormalities. Yeah. And they can pick up subtle dysfunction, obviously. So the, the big thing that's been banished around about global longitudinal strain is that particularly with some of the software that it, it focuses particularly on the endocardium some of the software and that's where you've got those longitudinal fibers uh, which are on the inside of that myocardium and if you're on the inside of the myocardium and you've got your big blood vessels on the outside of the myocardium the theory is is that those longitudinal muscle fibers are the ones that are most sensitive to ischemia because they're furthest away from the big blood vessels so if you get any abnormalities in your big blood vessels, any minor coronary artery disease, any uh, spasm, any decreased blood flow, any septic shock potentially, and you get microvascular abnormalities, those longitudinal muscle fibers are the ones that are going to be affected first. And that's why they think that global longitudinal strain, you might pick up abnormalities faster. And that's what this one's meant to show that you can, we know that people have, uh, hef pef, as I think it's called, you know, the, the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Often those guys have yeah. abnormal strain and they've got abnormal diastolic dysfunction. And that means that you're sitting in this phase where you're up here, where maybe if we catch these guys earlier, the theory is with things like strain, is you'll catch them before they actually get LV failure and the symptoms start to arise, mm -hmm. and that's when their mortality starts to drop off. And we've got some evidence to back this up. Um, I don't think I've got a lot of it here. But I guess I can show you lots of data that would be showing about the utility of the utility of using speckle tracking things, particularly like chemotherapy toxicity. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is I guess the big one. Some of those early hokums and things like that. Hypertensive disease, athlete's heart. They can show that yep. you can pick up more abnormalities with strain than you can with ejection fraction alone, which kind of makes sense, right? Yeah. Um, I'll show you a couple of pictures, and let's just ask you a couple of questions now. So what do you make of these, Lewis? So panel A, do you think that's normal or abnormal? So this is, uh, this is going to be a, a pattern recognition yeah. uh, from what you were just saying. So. Panel A is, so white was, so okay, so, I haven't really given you a legend, have I? Uh, let me see if I, no, it's all right. So if I assume that the, the, so red is, so dark red is normal, lighter red is getting sort of mildly abnormal, 
Super light yep. red is kind of moderate. White is severe, and then blue is dyskinetic. Yeah. So I'm looking at so blue's got positive values. So yeah. So nice. panel A, I think, is normal. Good. And you can see here that there's a normal sort of minus 15. Might be a little bit abnormal, but you know, but minus 17 is normal. Minus 20 is normal. So overall, red normal. Beautiful. Panel okay. B. And. Oh, I'm going to say panel B is maybe a Takasubo. Very nice. Fantastic. And that's because we've got the apical dyskinesis that comes up and you've got normal basal contraction. The mid's not doing a lot. Yep. The apex is ballooning, the apical ballooning. That is Takasubo. Very nice. Difficult to differentiate from LAD territory infarction, particularly if it's distal LAD. But what do you think panel C is? Well, I think that might be an LAD oh. infarct, given the distribution is uh, anteroceptal and, yeah, down right. to the apex. And that's exactly what it is. So that's LAD territory infarction. And so maybe we can use speckle tracking for maybe trying to help differentiate between the two. Is it 100%? Of course it isn't. Uh, I think if you're looking at strain values of minus five, you'd probably be able to pick that up with your eye anyway. Yeah. Right, let's okay. see if I can find another one. Right. Uh, so what, what uh, just out of interest, what would those um, look like on a 2D image? Uh, so you'd see, so on this image, you'd see the apical, uh, I can't remember which, I'm sorry, I don't have the actual 2D, but you'd see the apex ballooning up packets to you as exactly as you'd normally see it. And then this- So with those LAD. numbers, would it be, would it be subtle or would it be obvious? No, rip roaring. Rip roaring. Okay. I mean, this is so if it's remember the numbers are if those kernels are coming together, you have a negative value. If they're going apart, you have a positive value. So this is you're actually seeing the apex move out. So yeah, okay. Yeah, a yeah. rip roaring Takatsubo. And that's my argument for I guess we say that strain can differentiate between Takatsubo versus LAD territory infarct. We're talking about strain values here of minus five, so that's severe systolic dysfunction. And I reckon you should probably be able to pick that up if you can see the anterior wall on that two chamber, you should be able to see that the inferior wall is moving and the anterior wall is kind of doing nothing. Yeah. Yeah? But maybe you'd think it was hypokinetic rather than, you know, akinetic or something like that. So that kind of, and I guess that's, that's my argument that's particularly the critically ill, it's all down to image quality. Mm -hmm. um, let me see if I've got another pretty picture that we can attack Benny on. <laughs> I got the easy ones. You got the easy ones. <laughs> right, Benny, what's that? Oh, okay. Well, that looks pretty abnormal. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> very nice. So not a lot of red in there. It's all mm -hmm. light red, blues, and only a little bit of red. So the little bit of red is at the apex, yeah, right, and then the the dysfunction is predominantly in the basal section, particularly in the anterior. So this, I doesn't quite look like a cherry on top. And it's, it's sort of what it's meant to be. It's, it's not. It's not perfect, is it? But that's absolutely what we're talking. About. What do you What do you think by the cherry on top? Can you just explain what that means? So the cherry on top is um, it's, it's it's red at the apex, so it's normal at the apex. You have to preserve preserved apical function, but predominantly basal dysfunction, which is consistent with an amyloid. Uh, Beautiful. And so I guess oh, global I longitudinal it. strain might be the same for a Takatsubo's versus an amyloid or something. But the argument is, is uh, particularly, I guess, with this pattern recognition, it's shown to be particularly useful for trying to differentiate people who've got ridiculously thick in myocardiums. And you might think it's amyloid, but if you, you can use this to try and help pick up subtle apical versus basal abnormalities. And so sometimes picking up things like a hokum versus an amyloid versus severe hypertrophy versus athlete's heart, this kind of bullseye pattern in the cardiology world is thought to be quite useful for that. Um, and this is what amyloid's meant to look like and sometimes it's not perfect. I guess in the exams, they might give it to you with a big old red cherry on top, it might be a bit better. Um, are there any other good ones in here that I could show to you? All right, what about this one? 
Okay, so from a lateral dysfunction and again the preserved apex um, and basal as well. Uh, this might be might be ischemic. Yeah, it could be what go uh, territory. Circumflex, I would say. Yeah, circumflex, right um, coronary maybe. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, very yeah, nice. I think it could also be maybe consistent with hokum. Maybe yep. if you had kind of this asymmetrical, uh, asymmetrical pattern, obviously you're going to need two D pictures for that. But it's just trying to show you the, the way we kind of work through it. So if you've got values which are, you know, which are normal, so minus seventeen and above, they turn up red. Abnormal patterns turn up in, you know, the minus single figures. Very nice. Uh, that's probably it for that. There is a little bit of like pattern recognition, isn't it? Like yeah, pattern. definitely. Like with your asymmetrical septal hypertrophy. Uh, with where you get the sands and things like that. Yep. You see this nice sort of like the, the, that, that, that septal portion of the, um, it's, it looks very different to the rest of it. Absolutely, I agree. And maybe strain's good at that. I'll just take you into a couple of the little bit more of the nuances, okay? Because it, I guess for the, what I've just told you is I guess the, the mainstay of speckle tracking and that it's, um, Global longitudinal strain is what has been investigated the most, and it's it's what's the most published on and shown to elucidate subtle cardiac dysfunction. And in the critically, it's the same as in other literature. So, one of the reasons why I started learning about this in the cardiology uh, when I was spending some time in America, and it was around that time I started to do some research into it, and very quickly I figured out that it's not quite as simple as it had been made out to be, which is sort of what you've heard to date, but what you've heard from in the last half an hour is what had been told to me, and I thought it sounded wonderful, and so step forward to go into it, and it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. And so I, I think it just, this is where a word of caution comes into it. So one of the things that is possible with, one of the things that's possible with speckle tracking is you can get an awful lot of information out of it with a relatively, minimal amount of investigation and so lots of research is starting to come out in the cardiology and now starting to creep into the critical care where it's not just about strain we can also get what's known as things like strain rate which is the speed of deformation it's another way that we can assess uh, another way that we can assess uh, systolic function and as well as that you can look at it in the other way around a bit like tissue doppler where it's the speed of that movement forward and the speed of coming back at that annulus that speed coming back we use called the E prime and the A prime. We got a similar thing mm -hmm. with strain where you can get the strain rate early relaxation, which is a marker of diastolic dysfunction. Along with that, you can also get an idea about how quickly those lines come together when they come at a peak. And if they don't come together at the same time, that means that different parts of the myocardium are contracting at different time. And that's where you start to get the synchrony that comes in and if you can measure the time between the earlier segment contraction and the later segment contraction you can get what's known as time to peak strain and that is a marker of the synchrony that's been used but then also the problem comes that you've got different vendors and different vendors measure strain peak strain at different times and you've got to be careful where you're measuring strain you're using so here what we've got is pre-systolic strain or are we actually marking it when the aortic valve close, which we call end systolic strain? But here we can actually see that this curve actually carries on after the aortic valve is closed. And so this here with post systolic strain, this actually is another marker which could indicate useless contraction. Now this is a marker of inefficiency of cardiac function. It has been shown to be associated with mortality and heart failure maybe. But the idea that if your heart is contracting after the aortic valve is closed, then there is some abnormal cardiac function going on. Yeah. And the problem is, is that you can measure it in different, different vendors measure it at different times. You can set it to wherever you want, but you've got to know to look for it first of all. And this is why in some of the research, a lot of it doesn't even mention this. And why there's been a big push in the last, particularly the last five years, to try and standardize the way that everyone is doing global longitudinal strain. And just focusing on strain for the moment and just focus that everyone is doing it exactly the same way 
And although we've got different vendors and we know we can get slightly different results if you do it on Philips versus doing it on GE or Siemens or whatever, and the rule is, is that you do it the same way every time and you do it on the same machine every time, and that's the way you can compare them. Yeah, this is what a strain rate curve looks like. So here again, this is over one cardiac cycle. And you can imagine if I'm here at the beginning uh, at end diastole with the kernel sitting relaxed apart, as the, mm -hmm. as the contracts, they come together. And that's why the strain gets more and more negative as they come together. And then when it relaxes during diastole, so the end of the T waves, the beginning of the QRS, then it stretch back out. You can see that the strain uh, curve comes back to normal. In the strain rate curve, we can see this curve comes down. So here's the beginning of the QRS complex. The strain rate, it comes at very fast speed, and then it slows down as it gets towards the end of systole. So it comes at very fast speed, slows down as it gets toward the end of systole, and then it's a zero because that's so no speed, and then it comes back together. Okay, and then it's so then it's that's when it's then separating to come back out again. So it's, it stops at that peak, and then it comes back together, going in the opposite direction, and that's where you get your strain rate early relaxation and strain rate atrial kick or SRA. And I haven't actually seen much data on that, but people have used this as a way of measuring yeah. diastolic dysfunction, and again, shown to be potentially prognostic in heart failure. Um, yeah, okay. So I guess you get this lot of information that comes out. Along with that, we talked about global longitudinal strain is just the uh, assessment in one plane in the, from the apex. Global longitudinal strain, average of the three apical views. Bullseye plot, that pictorial representation. Circumferential strain, radial strain we discussed. And then the final three, twist, torsion, and untwist. So twist, as you can imagine, is the uh, how much the uh, how much the heart moves. So it's to take, particularly if you image at the, the base of the heart in a basal um, uh, view, you can measure how much that heart rotates round. You can then look at the apex. So after you've taken that short axis view, you then look at the apex view and you can measure how much that moves in the other direction. Okay? So you can look at the change in how those two move together and that's known as twist. So the difference from the apex going like that to the base that goes like that, they yep. add those together and that's known as your twist. So it's the angle difference at systole between the apical rotation, which is the anti-clockwise direction viewed from the apex and basal rotation, which is the clockwise. If you then normalize that to how much it then moves in, as so you take it from its, uh, the, in diastole, its maximum distance from the base to the apex, and then you come in to the, when it's in its full twist at end systole, that gives you an idea of torsion. So that means how much twist you're getting per centimeter. And then from there, you get your untwist. So an enormous amount of information can be gleaned from speckle tracking from relatively little analysis, okay? Yeah. And why don't I try and show you some examples? So maybe just before we do it, I'll show you just one more thing of what dyssynchrony looks like. So I was going to ask about septic cardiomyopathy. I saw that you've got a section in your paper there. Yeah, sure. Has it has it been studied in sepsis, septic shock? Well, that's very Looking interesting. Looking for early... There absolutely has, and that is the summary of papers in 2016. There are a few more now, including a couple of meta-analysis, because obviously you need a meta-analysis because there are more than two papers on the subject. And so they first started to be analyzed in 2012. Uh, there's some pretty dodgy research came out in 2014 by myself. Um, you can see the size of the studies are not massive, right? Yeah. So in 2016, there were a grand total of like nine or 10 or whatever it is there. There are a lot more that are coming out on it. And we're getting various answers. And I guess that's what I was trying to get at in this paper, talking about how they did their imaging, how they did their imaging, what the feasibility of it is, yeah. and how everyone's doing it in a slightly different way, which makes it really hard to analyze what's going on. Yeah. The bottom line is that most people have found that 
global longitudinal strain predicts uh, shows more cardiac dysfunction than ejection fraction and i certainly found that in my paper so the analysis that we did uh in septic cardiomyopathy So I guess this is, oh no, that's not what I want to show you. Sorry. Oh, I don't know. Somewhere in here, I put must be in the summary data. Basically, it's just showing how many patients have abnormal ejection fraction versus abnormal um, strain values. And the bottom line is, we found a load more patients had both abnormal as well as severe dysfunction when we use speckle tracking. And most of the papers find a similar kind of thing. The, yeah. different, the difficulty thing is, is it associated with mortality? And again, some people have found yes, some people have found no. And the meta-analysis seems to suggest that maybe there is a mortality, uh, mortality prognostic ability of strain. Again, yeah. I'm taking that with a bit of a pinch of salt, to be honest, because it depends how you do the analysis and everyone's doing it in a slightly different way. And I worry about who's doing it. Because I said, if you don't know what you're doing, you can get really weird results. And yeah. there's certainly a lot of data from people like the Tom Marwick's group who can suggest here that if you do, um, so this came out in Jace recently, learning about the learning curve with speckle tracking. And if you're mm -hmm. doing strain analysis, yeah, here we go. Look at the, so this is the comparison of global longitudinal strain, I think they call an intra-observer agreement. And it, if you've done less training, the, the confidence intervals increase. And the magic number to do is about 50 to get you to start being able to do the analysis. So here we go, this is better. Global longitudinal strain. So if you've got experts yeah. have the smallest confidence interval, those who are just learning enormous confidence intervals. And I'd put, you know, sometimes I'd put, kind of put people who are doing critical care echo studies and speckle tracking in this field over here. The experts yeah. of people have done more than a thousand. Uh, so, you know, it takes some practice, I think. You can't just, you can't give it to your medical students and ask them to do the analysis or give it to your research uh, registrar. You know, this is something that you've got to have <coughs> the experts doing. Um, just in the last 15 yeah. minutes, shall I just show you how to do it? Because that might make, explain it maybe a little bit better. So let me come over, yeah. let me bring you over onto the other screen. Hey, can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, yep. Oh, great. Cool. All right. I think it's that one. Okay. We'll just start off with just a normal, uh, just start off with a normal uh, study. Hang on, I've got you on the wrong buddy one. Hang on a sec. Share, share. Perfect. Okay, when I have a look at global longitudinal strain, I'll just show you an example of how to do it. So for global longitudinal strain, we want to try and look in the apical four, the apical three, and the apical two chamber. So to try and get the best analysis and to get the best tracking, 
you've got to have images that look a little bit like this to be able to do it. So rule number one is that you've got to have a reduced depth so that what you're interested in is filling the screen. You've got to be able to see the endocardium throughout the cardiac cycle. You've got to have a frame rate that's at least greater than 50. So that means just a single, uh, single um, analysis point. Okay. And again, a lot of this image optimization is not discussed in some of the literature, which makes me think that they might not know what they're doing. Once you've got that, and this is it's different on each computer, but the basic premise is the same. So you get the software up, you use three cardiac cycles and take an average over it. You choose your strain package and you've got to tell it which segment you're doing it. So here we're in the apical four chamber view and you start at the basal septum, it says here at the bottom. You start at the annulus and you click on it about seven to 12 times. Just try and find your inside of your myocardium. Oh. And it paints it like this. Okay. You got, whoops. You got to make sure that your width of your, in, of the area of interest sort of fills the myocardium, something like that. And when you think you're about in the right place, you press process. And you can see what the machine does. So it grabs hold of those speckles and it follows them over that cardiac cycle. And it tells you if you've got good tracking by giving you a tick. If it gives you a cross like that, it means that that's no, it doesn't think that it's any good. But you can override it either way and say, yes, that looks nice. And more importantly, I just look at the screen and just try and watch those kernels as they move together. And does it look like it's locking onto a particular piece of that myocardium and moving? And if it does, you say whoopee. And it looks something like this. Okay, so here we can see all the areas, all the values come together and then separate out. And that looks great. Okay, and if you want to go and have a look at lots of different types of results, you can here you can get all your different types of strain curves and you know, you can measure all the different parts that you're after and velocities and everything. So this is where you can get a lot of research data that comes out of it, which is looks super pretty and lots of pretty lines. But you just got to make sure you've got the right values. So I'd take something like this. I can store that. And why would the machine reject um, some of the speckled tracking? Because kernel, of... if it can't grab hold of those kernels, just, just like you were saying, I'm sorry to make that clear. So just like you're saying, if you think yeah. the kernels are not there or they change because you're going in and out of plane, the machine will pick yeah. that up and say, even with my compensatory stuff, you're still out. I don't think this is right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's the apical four. So we'll save that. Then we're gonna have a look at apical two. And then you get the same thing, strain analysis, two chamber. Track it out, make sure that the width is where you want it to be. Press go. That seems to be following it pretty well, so you can approve that. Again, one little segment not doing what it wants, so you can go back and have a look at it. But it's making little movements like that can make a huge difference to what's been going on, okay? Yeah. See, now it doesn't like it. So this is where you've got to know what you're doing to try and make it work. And it's really, really fiddly. And just in the meaning of time, I'm going to approve it all. And I guess this brings up another nice point. So if you've just got one value that's out, you see that when I made little changes, it could change the value quite dramatically. Global longitudinal strain yeah. is a way of kind of, it helps adapt for that. Because I've still got a value just for this, this one here of, of minus 21, which is normal. Yeah. I think it looks yeah. normal. So for regional wall motion analysis, it, it's often too subtle to be able to pick that up in my opinion and that's why global longitudinal strain might work but that's probably it okay we'll try the last one three chamber same thing again and you stop just at the lvot border
and that'll do. You've got to choose where the aortic valve closes. So I'm looking just at the aortic valve now, just scrolling through, it closes about there. And that means that the values, that's how you get your pre-systolic strain, your end systolic strain, your post-systolic strain. Okay? Yep. And from here, yep. you can then look at the whole picture, which is the BE layers. No, that's not what I want. BE only. And that's where you get your bullseye plot. So that's a summary of everything that we've just done. And at the bottom, we can see a global longitudinal strain, which is the average global longitudinal strain average of minus 20. So that's normal. It all looks, it all looks red. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of it, really. You know, I think that's probably all they're going to expect you to know for the exams. You know, understand what how low how strain analysis tracking is done. Um, you know what it is, how you get it, and what other values they expect you to know about. Yeah, strain, strain rate twist and torsion and uh and that would probably be about it and i think knowing the limitations which are that you've got a decent image quality you've got to optimize your image for it you've got to make sure that your tracking is good and for something like this i repeat the values three times to make sure i'm getting similar values each time and then i'm sure that i've got the right value um and so that's i guess yeah some of those limitations are important um, and and the best clinical applications you think for us? Uh, uh, sorry, that's a great question. Um, I might pull you back onto the other machine just for this, the last little bit. Uh, just going to go back onto the other machine. Just give me a sec. Uh, I guess the big thing for me is that you can also, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Yeah, cool. The the big thing for me is that the, the potential applications, I guess, is septic cardiomyopathy. That's where the majority of the research is done. But actually, for me, probably the best one that we've got is actually on the right ventricle. So the left ventricle I showed you how to do, the right ventricle, you do similar kind of similar kind of analysis but you do an rv centric view so something that looks a little bit like this where you just look at the right ventricle free wall and the apical four chamber so it's much more simple you just do it in one view and you're just looking at the lateral wall and with that lateral yeah. wall you can then paint that and get your rv free wall strain and this is a bit of a dodgy example of it but here you can see the three walls at the, at the back. You have to steal the software from the left ventricle, so it's not perfect, but you can look at the three and you take an average of those three lateral RV free wall. And that is, that's feasible to do. We can do it in about 80, 85% of patients in the critically ill. And <coughs> it's, it, it's not bad. And it picks up subtle dysfunction. And particularly the RV, this is the one that has been shown to be associated with mortality in the critically ill. So this is just data from, from what we did in septic right. cardiomyopathy. And you can see here that it's associated with bad outcomes when your RV free wall strain is down and that, and TAPSI misses it. I'll just show you one other thing if you like. Yeah. Which is, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And I guess the other big thing for me is this, if I can just find it. Um, Oh, this might be it. I don't know. 
So I'll just show you these things. I mean, first of all, looking at RV free wall strain in pigs, we figured out this is where we're doing it in animals. We can figure out that RV free wall strain is more sensitive than things like fractional area change. When we started doing it in about 100 patients who are on ventilators with ARDS, uh, we found, uh, what can I show you? Oh, maybe this, I don't know. Oh, I've taken it out. Sorry, buddy. We basically found out that RV free wall strain picks up a lot more abnormalities than uh, and TAPSI and fractional area change. Yeah. And the next thing I want to start yeah. looking at, what we're hopefully going to start doing, is looking at if you can pick up subtle dysfunction and it gets worse, is that associated with mortality? So I think in terms of the, in terms of the relevance of speckle tracking to the critically ill, it's in septic cardiomyopathy and an RV analysis, and particularly in identifying those at-risk right ventricles. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So I think it's an area that's going to bloom. Um, and, but I think before it blooms, we've got to make sure that we've got people who know about advanced echo, just standard comprehensive echo, first of all, and can do that well. And then we need to do, then we can get into the speckle tracking. Uh, and I guess- you, uh, Are you able to put those papers in the Dropbox? They're already in there. They are- Okay. Uh, if you, All right, well, uh, why don't we call it quits at that and I'll, um, just unless there are any other questions. All right, well, thanks yeah. very much, guys. That was great.